Happy Easter. Let's celebrate our risen Savior beginning with the call to worship. If you want to stand. The darkness is gone. A bright light floods into the new day of hope. Those who went to the tomb received good news. Jesus was not there. Jesus is risen in our hearts and our spirits. Jesus is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Our first hymn is on page 302 if you're using a hymnal. It's also on the screen if you prefer not to. We're going to sing the first four verses. Let's sing them joyfully. kids would like to go to junior church, um, Alyssa's going to walk down the center aisle so you can see her, and if you want to go with her, she'll take you down and show you where to go. Let's join in the opening prayer. God of hope, in the midst of death, you call forth life, when all hope seem gone. You raised Jesus from the grave. We come before you today, longing for your life-giving presence. God of new life, lift us from the tombs of despair and doubt, so we may rejoice in your power over death. God of joy, fill our hearts with alleluias as we sing your praises. Glory to God. Amen. You may be seated. It is traditional to share the hope of resurrection with those who have lost a loved one since last Easter. Um, what is traditional is each person receives an egg as a symbol of the new life that their loved one now enjoys because of the resurrection of Jesus. 
So if you will stand, if you've lost somebody in the last year, Alyssa will see that you get a resurrection egg. Do you have anybody? A couple. Once you get your egg, you can sit down, and then she'll know she's got everybody.
Easter means to me the resurrection of Jesus and the wash away of our sins that we should celebrate. What does Easter mean to me? Easter to me means an empty tomb. Jesus conquered death from the grave. And what, what would his death on the cross have meant had he not rose from the dead? What would life be like with no hope? Where would our hope be then? That's what Easter means to me, and I think it's the most important day of the year. Scripture for this morning comes from Matthew 28. I'm going to read the first 10 verses. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is um, the gospel reading for us this morning from the Gospel of Matthew. Our next um, joyful hymn is Day of Resurrection. Let's sing it together.
We come today to hear the story of Easter. Open our hearts so we might hear your truth anew. Be with us on this journey which leads to life and hope. Amen. He is risen. Happy Easter, everyone. Today we join with churches from all across the world doing something that has been done for centuries and centuries when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It was the love of God that caused Jesus to come to earth and to offer himself as a sacrifice on the cross for the world's sins. It is the love of God that continually offers to us new life through the risen Savior. So we have a whole lot to celebrate today. Today, we worship the risen Jesus. Today, we're going to talk about love reigns. For the next three weeks, we're discovering all the different ways that God's amazing love transforms our past, our present, and even our future. Many people underestimate the power of love. I would argue, however, that love is the most powerful force on the face of the earth. Many in this room can really relate to the kinds of things that drove them to do in order to win the heart of their spouse. You can think about that for a minute. Sometimes when you're really attracted to someone, your first encounter is, well, maybe a little less than amazing. You know, sometimes you blush. Or maybe when you're hoping to say something really impressive to get their attention, you end up saying something really dumb or you don't even get it out, you just stutter. But once that ice is broken, lots of wonderful, great things can happen. Love is the driving force between our sacrificial actions toward our family and friends. Let's be honest, people you love, you would do anything for, just so you can demonstrate how much you care for them. Love is powerful, and it moves us to do amazing things. Before there was ever an Easter Sunday, there had to be a Good Friday. Before there was a resurrection, there first had to be a death. For 33 years, Jesus walked on the face of the earth and he served the hungry, he healed the broken, he delivered the oppressed. He announced the coming kingdom of God to just about everybody he encountered. He, he told how God would restore all things to the way it was in the beginning. He claimed to even be the son of God. And many believed him to be the true king of kings. They believed what he said. This kind of thinking and teaching caused a whole lot of conflict in the world in which Jesus lived. You see, at that time, the ruler of the ancient Near East was Rome. Rome had installed a vassal king named Herod the Great, to come in and, and keep things under control. Those, those Jews didn't like having somebody in control over them. So they kept trying to throw off the Romans. And so they thought Herod would be able to settle things down. Herod was a tyrant, which is one of the reasons they thought it would, he would be able to do it. And he was constantly afraid that any authority he had would be undermined. So he was always looking for people who wouldn't go along with what he said. Another potential king would be a threat to Roman rule and therefore had to be completely and totally eradicated. Both Herod and Jesus, after all, could not possibly rule over Israel. So the Jewish leaders and the Roman centurions worked together to have Jesus arrested. He was brought to trial because of his claims to be God. He was convicted. He was beaten nearly to death. He was then forced to carry a rugged wooden cross all the way to a hill on which he would be killed. The crucifixion of Jesus is marked by ridicule and disbelief. The soldiers mocked Jesus by placing a sign over his head, calling him the king of the Jews. Not because they believed him, but so they could mock him. Those who passed by mocked Jesus by telling him to save himself if he was really the son of God really the son of God, you can take yourself off this cross. The priests and the teachers, they mocked Jesus by telling him to get off the cross. None of them understood the true task of Jesus' power and authority wasn't actually in his ability to save himself from crucifixion. Of course he could do that. 
his real demonstration of power would be in his demonstration of his ability to overcome the death that the crucifixion would result in. Sometimes I think we miss the proof of Jesus' lordship because actually we're expecting him to prove himself in certain ways, ways we define. And then he ends up doing something different. Many individuals have decided in their hearts they're never really going to trust in Jesus until he meets their expectations. If you do this, then I will. Unless Jesus heals their relative or gives them this particular job, stops world hunger is one I've heard before. Even I've heard, you know, write something in the sky so I can see it for myself. They will never trust him. They'll never obey his authority in their lives. They can never allow themselves to see him as the king unless he does what they tell him to do. I'm afraid this kind of mentality is the kind of struggle that plagued those of uh, their Jesus' death. It's also the same mentality that drove Herod to be part of the death of God's son. When we are demanding Jesus to prove himself on our terms, we rob ourselves of having him work the way he can work in our lives. Herod was by far not the last one to be threatened by the kingship of Jesus. He was not the only one to struggle with the idea of Jesus being completely in charge. The truth is, we still have a really hard time with that today. In our lives, there can only be one king in our lives as well. It's been said that on the throne of our hearts sits the one who reigns in our lives, and we have to choose whether that will be Jesus or whether it will be ourselves. That's the closest thing I could find to a throne. We often live selfishly. The other choice we have, because there is another choice, is to put Jesus on the throne of our lives. But I had to get out of the chair and able to be able to do that. When Jesus is on the throne of our lives, then love reigns. We can listen for his leading. And when that happens, what we do is we find ourselves putting other people first. We live sacrificially. So when when it it comes comes to the the way you speak, act, and live, the the truth truth is, there there can can only be one one king. If If Jesus is dead, dead, then then none of this matters. But if he did indeed rise from the dead, then that changes everything, because that makes him the king. Three days after Jesus was crucified and laid in a tomb to everyone's shock and amazement, everybody who knew him believed he was going to overthrow the Romans, not be killed by them. But three days later, he appears in bodily form to many of the disciples and even to other people who weren't disciples. This had never happened before. They had seen him killed. They knew he was dead, completely dead. And now he was eating with them. He was walking with them. He was talking with them. Jesus' love for humanity had completely overcome death and defeated evil once and for all. I don't know about you, but that's good news, that overcoming evil. He showed that he really is the true king overall. There's a famous artist um, named Paul Gustave Dore. He's from the 1800s, so if you haven't heard of him, you're probably in good company. He was traveling around Europe, and I, I put a picture. This is... Um, Uh, a picture of Jesus that he uh, drew, or painted, I should say. Um, He was was traveling around Europe, and he lost his passport. Yes, they had passports even in the 1800s. And he came to a border crossing, and he realized he had lost his passport. And, of course, the the people guarding the, the border said, well, you can't go without a passport. And he gave his name thinking, well, maybe once they recognized his name, because he was, you know, a pretty famous artist at the time, 
Dor hoped he would be recognized and he'd be allowed to, to pass. The guard said, you know, the truth of the matter is, lots of people try to cross this border by claiming to be people that they're really not. I need proof. Well, Dor insisted that he was who he was and, you know, without the passport, he couldn't really prove who he was. All right, so the official will give you a test and if you pass the test, we'll let you cross the border. So he handed him a pencil and some paper and he told the artist to sketch these people that are standing right over here. And Dor did it so quickly and so skillfully, the guard knew he had to be an artist and probably was indeed the man he said he was. He was convinced his work confirmed his word. Jesus' work confirmed his word as well. Though many doubted him and mocked him, death did not have the last word. It didn't have the final say. Love did. The scripture tells us this is true in one of the most famous passages of all. People who, who don't memorize very much scripture usually can tell you what John 3.16 says. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever lives and believes in him can have everlasting life. God so loved the world, he sent Jesus to live and even die for us. When we put our faith, our hope, our trust in Jesus' life and death and resurrection, we can be saved. That's why we have so much to celebrate on this day. We have been given an opportunity to have eternal life. We know because of Jesus, the worst thing that can ever possibly happen to us will not be the last thing that ever happens to us because we too can experience resurrection and new life. After Jesus was resurrected, his final words to his followers revealed to us the truth behind the Easter story. Easter is the day Jesus was given all authority on earth and on hev in heaven. It didn't matter how many people doubted, he's still the king of the Jews. It doesn't matter how many people mocked him, he was able to rescue himself, and not just himself, but the entire world as well. No matter how many people questioned his power while he was on earth, he did indeed defeat the cross once and for all. The love of God was the authority and is now reigning over the entire world and over our lives as well. His final instructions to his followers was to go into all the world and make disciples. He told them to spread the good news of his resurrection and his love to absolutely any person who would listen. We have been invited to teach the way of Jesus because it changes the world. I don't know about you, but I think our world could stand just a little bit of adjustment here and there. Today, if you consider yourself to be a Christian, then this instruction has been given, been given to you as well. You are a part of making disciples. The Greek word in this passage for disciple is a word that means somebody who learns or somebody who is a student. We are to allow ourselves to be students and learners of the way of Jesus and to help others become learners and students as well. It holds with it a feeling of progression. To be a disciple is not just a one-time event. It's a lifelong progression of becoming more and more like Jesus. It's a process of transformation. Over time, we learn to live generous lives. We learn how to forgive people who hurt us. We learn how to serve others. We learn how to practice self-control. We learn how to be people of peace. When we submit to the love of Jesus in our lives, we are compelled to be like him. And we're also compelled to invite others to come to know his love and his grace and his peace and his joy as well. That is what it means to let love reign in us. I became a believer when I was very young, uh, seven or eight years old. I'd have to really sit down and think hard to, to get just when it was, because it was right near my birthday. It's one of those right before or right after. So I was seven or eight years old. I was really young. I was at Hopewell Church, and Reverend Evelyn Beard was the pastor. 
I went to the altar and I repented of my sin and I gave my heart to Jesus with all the sincerity that I had. And I can tell you, I have not had a single moment's regret. You don't have to look very hard at me to see that when I was seven or eight, it was a really long time ago. I knew Jesus loved me. I knew Jesus had died for me. But I also knew he rose again for me. And because he did all that for me, I wanted to give him my life. Since the time I prayed for Jesus to live in me, I have seen my life change in so many wonderful ways. I have spent my life trying to allow God to have more and more of my life. The final reminder we're given by Jesus before he ascends up into heaven is that he will always be with us until the very end. So even on those tough days, we know he is with us. Maybe today you feel like God has forgotten about you. I want to remind you, you are never, ever alone. Jesus lives and dwells inside of those who trust him by the power of the Holy Spirit. This means it doesn't matter what you're going through, and it doesn't matter what you have to face. You are never alone. I am convinced that in this place today and those who are joining us in various places online, that there are indeed two kinds of people, just two. One, there are some people here who have never, ever made the decision to let love reign in their hearts never decided that they should follow Jesus. Maybe you've been waiting for Jesus to prove himself to you, and it just hasn't happened. Maybe you don't really want to give up control of your life, and so you've never submitted your control of your life to Jesus. Today, I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus. I want to invite you to offer him your heart and to become a disciple, a student, and become that disciple for the rest of your life. To do this is very simple. I'm gonna say a prayer and all you have to do is sincerely pray with me. You don't have to pray it out loud, just pray it in your heart. Jesus, I confess I have lived my own way and under my own authority for far too long. I've sinned against others and I've sinned against you. I'm sorry and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died and you rose again for me. I welcome your spirit to work in my life and to obey you above everything else. I want to join you in sharing the good news of resurrection. Thank you for promising to always be with me for the rest of my days. Amen. Now, if you pray that prayer with a sincere heart, you're now a Christian. You're now a disciple of Jesus. And so strive to live every day uh, with Christ reigning in your heart, showing love to others. There's another kind of person, too. There may be some here today who trusted in Jesus for a long time. But you've kind of gotten weary a little bit on that whole obeying him stuff. Maybe you strayed and, and you decided that at least some parts of your life you want to figure out for yourself. Easter reminds us that we can once again repent and obey. If this is you today, I want to remind you that Jesus promised to never, ever leave us. He still loves you. He is still with you. Commit once again to live for him. This Easter, may you see the resurrection of Jesus as the proof of his love. And may you let that, rain, that love reign in your life. May you join God in spreading the good news to the entire world. He is risen. Happy Easter. On Easter, we affirm our faith. We affirm our faith that Jesus is indeed alive. So let's stand and do that. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. You might have noticed that our theme this morning is hope, Easter hope. The message of Easter is that the risen Christ gives substance to our hope. There's a difference between kind of wishing and having hope. We should note, first of all, the sense of hopelessness that had completely enshrouded all of those people who followed Jesus after his crucifixion. If actions speak louder than words, then those first disciples made it abundantly clear. They really didn't believe anymore that Jesus was the hope of the world. They were filled with fear, and they didn't know what to do. Easter Sunday is a day of bright colors, joyful music, enthusiastic worship for us. We cannot appreciate the Easter message, however, if we can't understand that that first Easter was born in total darkness. His disciples believed Jesus was the Messiah who'd come to deliver Israel. And yet there he was in a borrowed grave. His side, there was a deep gash from a spear. His hands and his feet were disfigured by the marks of nails. His brow was a tangled mess of hair and blood where the crown of thorns had been pushed down. They were mocking his kingship. And then his back was just a terrifying grid of wounds from the 39 lashes. Where were the 10,000 angels who could come at his beck and call? His followers were now cowering behind closed doors and their emotions full of despair, probably even a little cynicism. Perhaps you've been there. Maybe you have lived a while behind closed doors because of COVID. Whatever the reason, we are launching 21 Days of Hope. And if you want to take part in the 21 Days of Hope, um, take out your phones. I know sometimes we say put away your phones during church. Not going to say that. Take out your phone and text the word HOPE to 740-513-3929. It's in the bulletin if you, um, if you can't see the, the screen very well. Share your name and your email. You don't have to share any more than that. Just your name and your email. And you will receive messages of hope for the next 21 days. If you know somebody who needs hope and they're not here today, you can share this with them. In other words, it's not just close to the people in this room at this time. If you share you know, the number with them and they text hope, they too will receive 21 uh, days of hope. And if they don't start today, that's okay. They'll start whenever they start. So they can text hope and they can also receive messages of hope. I think Randy wants to say something about hope. As Dave Love would say, good morning, church family. So I was asked to speak on what, it, what I think hope means. First thing I did is pull out my fancy little mobile device and I Googled the word hope. Hope means to trust in, wait for, look for, or desire something or someone to, an ex, to expect something beneficial in the future. I want to tell you a quick story about Sam Starling. Sam Starling gave his life to Christ when he was 13 years old. And he devoted to serve the Lord every day since then. Sam became a pastor and was a pastor in West Virginia for 48 years. He served the Lord and loved the Lord with all his heart. Well, disease kicked in. Dementia kicked in. His son come up to me just this past week and said, Easter for a pastor is like the Super Bowl. They prepare for the Easter service all year long. 
And he said, my dad cannot tell you what Easter means. So why do I tell you that story? I think, even for myself, some of us does not know what Easter is this past year. With COVID, with jobs being furloughed, we forget about Christ sometimes. With social injustice or political turmoil, not gathering in church, we forget Christ. But hope is to trust in, wait for, look for, or desire something or someone to expect something beneficial in the future. So what does hope mean to me? Hope means the conversation that we used to have out on the asphalt at Biker Sunday. Hope means the churning of ice cream, homemade ice cream from an antique tractor. Hope means someone driving a loved one or a friend to an appointment. Hope means a backpack for a kid in need. Or the shoebox ministry that we send shoeboxes overseas. Hope for me means sponsorship for an Emmaus walk or chocolate chip cookies before you go into prison. Hope means to me the greeting cards or the birthday cards or the anniversary cards the seasoned lady sends to us when we just need it. Hope means to me the bags of food that our food pantry supplies to the people in our community in need. Or how about the Wednesday night meals? Hope means to me a quiet and warm place for the AA members to meet or the Boy Scouts. Hope means to me the angel trees that we sponsor at Christmas and the blankets that the ladies and the scarves that the ladies make during selling. So what does hope mean to me? Hope means church. Because the church makes today better and tomorrow even brighter. As we come to our prayer time, do we have any joys or concerns to share today? We can think of all kinds of joys. Yes, Wayne. Kay gets, gets to, to come, come home, home on Thursday. We need to pray for Grace's brother, Calvin, who is now in hospice care, and Dick Barber, who is now in Main Street Nursing Home. And um, let me pray, keep praying for peace for, for all of them, too. Yeah, yeah, Terry. Yes, yes. Good, good to see, see some, some folks who've been missing, missing for... Been, been just, just over, over here, here hasn't it? Yeah, yeah angels. We need to keep praying for Caleb. The, the joy is that everything went uh, well Tuesday with his um, exam, and 
Um, that went well, but they have uh, discovered that he still um, does have some um, heart problems, a hole and a couple leaky valves that will indeed have to be fixed um, in the next uh, few months. So we'll keep praying for him. No joy for Easter? Any, anybody's family getting together for the first time? And maybe not the first time, but some, I've heard some families are getting together. Yeah, Becky. Going to hold a new grandchild, for the, great-grandchild for the first time today. That's a big joy. And I hope Rory's doing better, too. Good. So she's eaten. Anybody else? Good to be back to see familiar faces. It's good to have you back. everybody? Let's pray. God of awesome joy, be with us this day as we celebrate the resurrection of your Son, our Savior Jesus. Let the light of your love flood into our lives and through us to all those who have been captured by darkness, so the light may give them healing, might give them freedom, might give them hope. As we witness the surprise of the women at the tomb, the appearance of the Savior to Mary and her good news brought to the disciples, let us remember this good news exists for us today. Darkness does not win. Death is not victorious. Jesus is alive. You have raised us with Jesus to a new life of hope and service. Let the joy of this good news swirl around in our hearts. Let excitement for service and ministry burst forth from us. Let us truly be the Easter people you've called us to be. For we ask these things in the name of the risen Lord and pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing uh, the amazing Easter hymn, Up from the Grave He Arose.
Christ is risen. May God's blessing of new life be yours. Hallelujah. The gift of peace fills our hearts. The tomb is empty. May that give you hope. Hallelujah. We go forth to tell the good news. We have seen the risen Lord.